The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. The Gospel of the Lord. My friends, we are very familiar with the story of Mary as related in the Gospels, the Annunciation, the Visitation, the birth of Jesus, the presentation in the temple, Mary's closeness to her son during his ministry, right up to that moment when she stands beneath the cross as the mother of sorrows and where she becomes our mother too. She continues to be present after the resurrection. And in experiencing her own ascension, assumption, and glorification, she continues to play out that role as mother from her place in heaven. It is a remarkable feature of our faith that Mary holds such a special place in it. Devotion to Mary has a very long history in the life of the church. Hopefully, we don't forget her, because she certainly doesn't forget us. She is there very much in the tradition of the church. They are very much in the grassroots of Catholic life. There we find Mary. If we ask ourselves the question, why do so many people go to places like Lourdes, Fatima, Knock, Metrigori, Walsingham, Guadalupe. Why do people go to these places? They go because they want to encounter Mary, their mother. Mary was and is the mother of Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, who was born into this world. We have just celebrated the birth of the Lord at Christmas. When he came into this world to bless it with the radiance of his presence, and to lift us up to the Father once again. He is the God for us in a human way. And because Mary is his mother, she is unique, she is special. 
between the mother and the son, there's a very special bond, a very special connection, which was there and continues to be there. Being a mother is not an easy business, and yet it is something that's full of intimacy. In ordinary terms, in terms of the world, Mary was quite ordinary. What makes her very special and unique is her being the mother of Jesus. We are familiar with those words. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that through him the world might be saved. All of that happened through Mary. So Mary becomes the mother of the church at the foot of the cross, at the instigation of her son. The bond between the mother and the son is extended to us. Mary becomes the new Eve. She brings salvation to a situation of rebelliousness and disobedience. Her motherhood takes on an awesomeness. The Gospels don't tell us that much about Mary beyond what we have already mentioned, because the Gospels are more concerned with telling the story of Jesus and the faith of the early church. But Mary is part and parcel of that story. She was a thinker, Mary. She pondered these things in her heart. She did that at Bethlehem. We are familiar with the words of Mary at the Annunciation. I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let what you have said be done to me. We are familiar as well with her words at Cana. Do whatever he tells you. Our Christian faith is based on revelation, on the notion of God who reveals himself to us in so many ways. It is God who issues the relationship, the invitation. It is he who always makes the first move. It is not something that we conjure up ourselves by our own efforts. Our faith is a gift from God to us. And revelation is transmitted to us in two ways, in tradition and in Scripture. Scripture is tradition in a written forum. And these two, Scripture and tradition, are very closely connected. They come from the same divine wellspring. And Mary is certainly there in that tradition, in that tradition of the church. Christian communities who don't accept tradition and focus entirely on Scripture as the only means for the transmission of revelation, they will tend to sideline Mary from the center of things. Within the tradition, of course, 
it is given its best expression and reflection in the rosary. The rosary, which is a centuries-old prayer, which is meant to be a meditation on the Lord's life, where Mary has a very important part to play in. Of course, the rosary is not recited nowadays as much as it used to be. But up to the time of Vatican II and the liturgical innovations in the liturgy, the rosary was the main way of participating at Mass. It took the place of the Missal and the Psalter in the church. The feast of the rosary goes right back. It was given, first of all, to the Carthusians, and then to the Dominicans. It was celebrated after the victory at Lepanto, 1571, promulgated as a feast by the then Pope, Pius V, celebrating the victory of the small Christian force over the much larger Muslim force, a victory that was attributed to the Rosary. Pope John Paul II added on what we call the mysteries of light, mysteries which are full of hope. It's interesting as well that the tradition of having beads and counting prayers, that goes back a long way. St. Paul himself, after his conversion, when he went into the Arabian desert on retreat before beginning his great ministry as apostle of the Gentiles, he carried with him a pocket full of pebbles. So the use of beads goes back a long time, goes back at least to the 14th century. Pope John Paul himself, of course, was very keen on the rosary as a very powerful prayer. So much for tradition. What about Scripture? What about the celebration of the Word? which we have in Scripture. This year, as you know, has been designated as the Year of the Word. The basic idea is to follow the axiom of St. Jerome, the great biblical scholar, who said something like this, that knowledge and love of Scripture equates with knowledge and love of the Lord. So the basic idea during this year is to improve our knowledge and love of Scripture through reading the Scriptures, through becoming more familiar with the Scriptures, and in that way developing our knowledge and love of the Lord. We are being asked to upgrade our knowledge and love of Scripture for that very reason. Mary is the mother of the church. In virtue of her association with her son in the mystery of salvation, she was there from the very beginning. At the very beginning, we see Mary with the apostles after the resurrection of the Lord and his ascension, praying for the coming of the Spirit, which happened at Pentecost. Her protective influence is highlighted and celebrated. As well as being mother, she is the model and type for the church, because she is the one who leads the way 
in faith and charity. She is the one who shows us the way in which the church is meant to move, as well as being mother and model of the church. She is a member. She is the first disciple. She is the one who shows us the way. And she shows us that way through her assumption into heaven. Her assumption shows us what the church will be one day. Of course, as members of the church, we lag behind. We fail. But nonetheless, we plod along, continuing on that journey of faith and charity, which was negotiated by Mary herself as the Blessed Mother of the Son of God and as the mother of her children. Next week, we will read a pastoral letter from the Cardinal. And the theme is very much Our Lady and dedicating this country once again as the dowry of Mary to Our Lady. And I just quote from that letter to be read next week. A few days ago, Cardinal says, I was privileged to meet Pope Francis. At my request, he blessed a new icon dedicated to Our Lady of Walsingham. He did so because he knows that during this Lent, on the 29th of March, all are invited to make a personal act of dedication of our country to Our Blessed Lady. In doing so, we repeat the dedication made in 1381 by Richard II of England, who promised this land and its people as the dowry of Mary. There is much for us to learn about being the dowry of Mary and the love which is expressed in that title. This fits well into our Linton journey. Mary will always lead us to her son. She will take us to him so that he can show us his love and mercy. There are two special occasions during which we can invite Mary to lead our Linton journey. The first is the three-day period from the 19th to the 22nd of March, when the statue of Our Lady of Walsingham will come to Westminster Cathedral. There will be three days of devotion and renewal. Please do come if you can. The second occasion is the three days from the 26th to the 28th of March, leading up to the National Day of Rededication on the 29th of March. I hope that all of you can observe these days of prayer, asking Mary to embrace this country of ours, to instill in us a truthfulness and a love of justice, so that we may experience, as she herself did, the joy of the Lord's presence. We all know well the title of Mary as our sorrowful mother. We turn to her in our sorrows. Yet there is another tribute to her, even more deeply rooted in our tradition. It is that of the joys of Mary. These joys, often numbered as seven, include the coming of the angel Gabriel to Mary at the Annunciation, and the wondrous birth of her son, our blessed Savior, and of her glorious entry into the happiness of heaven. We share in them, for they are the great joy of our faith. Indeed, we are called to be heralds of this joy in a world often in need of joyfulness. May Mary help us to know and share her joy as we live and proclaim our faith.